Hello and welcome to Deprogram with Terry Smith. If it is your first time here, if you found the show via the algorithm, this is a new channel, so please hit like and subscribe. Uh, I'm very excited about our show today. I'm here to interview and talk to Martina Marcota, who describes herself as a disgraced New York City nightlife icon, a model and performance artist named Lady Alchemy. She is also the owner of Magnum Opus Productions, and she has experience with cancellation in the dancing world. <laughs> so without further ado, welcome, Martina. I'm sorry I laughed about that. No, no, it, it's absolutely ridiculous. And it's hard to comprehend. <laughs> it's crazy because, you know, I have a lot of, uh, I'm just going to boost your mic just a little bit here. I have a lot of experience talking with people in the knitting world about woke. And a lot of knitters watch my show and for those who are outside the knitting community, they always think that's hilarious. That yeah, that's I mean, I kind of laughed. When you, yeah, I kind of laughed when you mentioned it earlier. I was like, huh, knitting, which, by the way, it's cool. I just started getting into it as well. But yeah, then you think, wow, like the knitting community is sitting around talking about woke or anti-woke. Yes. Like, wow, really? <laughs> it's crazy. If anybody, if you want to learn more about that, there's a, um, a writer named uh, Catherine Jebson Moore. And she did a series of articles about it for Colette a couple years ago. Oh, wow. But girl, it is insane. So, so I'm not, I'm not, I guess I shouldn't be surprised that woke has infiltrated dancing. Uh, yeah. But I'm sure there are people who might find this interview who are a little surprised. So would you mind starting us off by just telling me a little about yourself and what you were doing when you first encountered woke, I guess? Oh, God. I mean, I'm from New York. So and I went to NYU in the early 2000s. So I've experienced and I'm from like the Woodstock, New York area. <laughs> so what I've does been, that mean? like, do you know, you know, Woodstock? The, right. Is like, it a hippie kind of area? It's very hippie. It's okay. very artsy. It's very hippie. Uh, so I it's that whole world. I mean, NYU, New York City the hippie kind of culture up in like the Woodstock area. It's, it's all very lefty. So I've been around it. I happen to personally be a Republican like my whole life. Uh, I'm first generation American. My mother came here from Croatia and there was like the Yugoslavian breakup in the nineties. Mm -hmm. So we came here, stayed here. And uh, do you know anything about Croatians? They're Roman Catholic. They're very traditional very traditional type people and uh they yugoslavian breakup there was communism my mom lived through was she's very anti-commie so the upbringing that i have is very uh, i would say right wing or republican and it was definitely conservative my upbringing i never considered myself uh, a conservative person because let's face it i i did burlesque, you know, and I always thought I was like, oh, I'm part of the freaks and I love, you know, the LGBT and I support whatever. I'm kind of a weirdo. Uh, you know, I like my Catholic tradition. That's cool. But I kind of found my faith a little bit more through the lens of like alchemy. So like a typical millennial growing up in America, I never really appreciated the, my Catholic upbringing up until I kind of started researching alchemy. And then I'm kind of like, oh, cool. I get it. Like agnosticism, esoteric stuff. It's like a weird sideways angle of, of Catholicism that I got into and I grew a new appreciation for it. So there was that. Uh, I don't know. I just, I was pretty anti-woke growing up. So I was around a lot of wokeness, but mm -hmm. I was kind of not really, didn't buy into it. And it was fine. All my friends kind of just laughed at me. Like, I'm like, oh, Martina. You know? It's kind of like that crazy uncle you have that says crazy shit at parties. So you're kind of an anomaly because you said you've always been a Republican, but you weren't conservative. So you were like in a liberal world and you're very liberal in your outlook right, on things. Right. Yeah, but no, but then it, yeah, correct. And then it came around, it was like the mid 2010s. And I mean, definitely 2016 was like the peak of it. But I started to see maybe 2014, 2015, when you watch uh, shows on Netflix or whatever, you start to kind of see some of the SJW stuff coming in. And I was kind of like, 
what the hell, you know, like there'd be a show about, you know, a religious family, but ha ha, that like Catholic mom ha has a gay son and she's just so backwards and, you know, ignorant and all that. And I was kind of like, well, that's kind of mean. Like, I don't see religious people like that. I think religious people are, are uh, selfless. They're really nice, good people. Like, but Hollywood would try to portray them a certain way. And I was kind of like, well, that's a bit off, you know? And then, it, like I said, I'm part of the LGBT community, but then only as a supporter, I, I'm not particularly gay, but, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> just trying to put it out there. I'm not gay, but I was around them and drag queens, burlesque and drag queens kind of going hand in hand. Mm -hmm. So I never really wanted to go, oh, I'm conservative because I mean, I dance around in pasties in a thong. That's not very conservative, <laughs> you know? Can you tell people what, for people who may not know, because I, I was uh, tangentially in the burlesque world. I worked with a comedian who had a burlesque show because, like you said before we started, comedy and burlesque kind of go hand in hand. And um, for anybody who doesn't know what burlesque dancing is, can you just describe that? Yeah, and that's why in my bio I, I focus more on like performing uh, performance artists. I'll do like avant garde things. I like all sorts of stuff, but I kind of got into performing. Uh, my stage name is Lady Alchemy through burlesque because uh, it was fun. It was an opportunity uh, to create my own costumes. I love costumes and performances. And if you look it up, it has its roots in comedy, which is why they go hand in hand. And uh, they're kind of really campy performances, which is why they go hand in hand with drag. Mm -hmm. And it was just really campy, silly things. But then they kind of started to veer some uh, different genre of burlesque, which was kind of like the art of the art of the tease and just, uh, you know, the strip tease, which is kind of really fun to, um, have a lot of costumes and feathers yeah. and you show like there's what, what's your name? Sally Rand is the one that I really liked. And if you look her up, it's from the like black and white time of the, uh, the world fair. She did the world fair back in like mm -hmm. Chicago, was it Chicago and like the thirties or some shit. And, um, it was beautiful. She had this one piece nude outfit that had like sparkles all over it with these giant fans. And it was just so magical and beautiful. And uh, I really liked that beauty aspect of burlesque. So I don't do the comedy burlesque, but it certainly mm -hmm. has some comedy to it. And the hosts of burlesque um, tend to be comedians. So I work with Cirque people, magicians, a lot of magic yeah. acts, uh, a lot of Cirque, burlesque, uh, sideshow kind of freaks and mm -hmm. you know, all that stuff. So it was definitely a circus type thing that uh, I would perform in. And burlesque is kind of like the beauty of, of that. And uh, I worked at a theater in New York City that was basically Studio 54, but like today, not like the 70s. Yeah. And, but it was very similar. It was wild. Celebrities were there. It was hard to get into. You had to be like cool enough and dress really cool or spend lots of money or have a connection. What and was it called? It was called The Box. Okay. People in New York might, might know of it and they'll go, oh shit, the box, you worked there. And it was all of that. It was just a big, crazy circus of all sorts of different things going on. And my job was to be like the queen of the night and have a beautiful avant-garde costume and, and be like the beauty there. So it was fun. I, you're reminding me of, before we get into the woke stuff, so I you're right about the comedy aspect, the glamour aspect. Did you ever go to um, Miss Exotic World, the competitions? I know uh, of it, and I know people that have won it. I performed with them, but I never did the competitions. Though. Oh, I got to go a couple oh, you times. Did? Yeah, because one of the the comics I was working with, who was doing burlesque, um, hosted one year and performed, and um, it was so much fun to see. We probably know some people in common, but but there's this element to it. It's not like uh, it's not like the, a strip club. It, they're, they're, people are there. Yes, they're stripping down to pasties, but a lot of the performances have this tongue in cheek. Um, That's the comedy nature. Part. That's yeah. the comedy part. And yeah. one of my favorite acts was a uh, uh, Trixie Little and the Evil yes. Hate Monkey. I've Do you know them? I know those two. I performed with them at the box. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I love them. They're like acrobats too, like They're full amazing. on acrobats. And he dressed like a monkey and he was always like playing pranks on her yeah. while the, in their performances. That's and burlesque. yeah. Yeah. I love they're they're real life. They're I mean, I don't know if this I think they still are. They were a real life couple, so it was really, really cute. I loved it. Yeah. 
That's awesome. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you got into burlesque and you were performing in New York and you were living in this hippie artsy kind of community and doing dance, but we're also a Republican, which shouldn't be a big deal. You were like the anomaly of the oddity, right? I mean, I knew that they were extreme leftists by conversations and by the nature of everything. And I knew that they were extreme feminists as well, which is something I never really bought into. So I kind of don't like confrontation. I'm very passive and sensitive. So an argument would like really like make me uncomfortable. So I never said anything really like backstage or, or anything with my coworkers, but those of my friends, my gay friends and whatever behind the scenes, like, yeah, it would be myself. And I would say, say things and they knew what I was and it was never really a big deal. And they just kind of laughed me off and go, Oh, Martina. And the first time I think it was maybe 2013 is when I heard at my friend's house, there were a group of gays and someone said something that made me react. And this is an old school term. I'm sure maybe you'll remember this, but no one says this anymore. But I said, that's reverse racism. Oh, <laughs> no yeah. one says that anymore. Yeah. But I think that that was reverse racism. And I remember one of them looked at me and went, well, reverse racism actually doesn't exist because racism is institutional and blah, blah, blah. And you just like, gave me this whole spiel of how like black people can't be racist and it's like only like white people are racist and it's institutional like this whole thing and i just remember being like racism is racism it's hate yeah. against the race yeah. like i don't know what you're taught like where that definition come from and i just thought it was him being like i don't know they were younger so i was just i don't know what this young people are talking about what this new definition is but i cannot believe where we are today like a decade later and it is yes. like like that is the definition of racism now, apparently. Honey, let me tell you, I was one of these misguided social justice people pushing that new definition. Huh. And I used to, I was a true believer. It was like, wow. they, I learned that definition. Racism is prejudice plus power. And right. there, therefore they, they basically, they divide everyone into identity groups and they say, some groups have power, some don't. They don't look at people as individuals, you know? And once they get you to believe that, like I did, and to buy that, then by by buying that new definition, they can get you to believe right. that it's impossible to be racist towards white people or it's impossible for people of color to be racist. and and Which is um, very dangerous thing. Which is very dangerous. Like, think about where that leads, yeah? Like, but... I believed it and I was pushing that for a long time. And um, when, when I think back on that now, it's just kind of, I don't know. It helps, it helps me understand though, where that's coming from. I think a lot of people get caught up in it because they have good intent and they want to do something to end depression. They want to do something to be a good person. And they just start by saying, okay, here, good hearted person. Let me, let me change a few words for you. Right. You know, and that's what it is. These things. changing words, it's changing definitions. And I mean, there was another moment where I was performing, I think 2014 uh, ish. It was upstate New York and Buffalo at a casino. And if you can think about New Year's Eve upstate near Canada, it is freezing cold snow. The wind is insane. So we get a flight up there and it's a bunch of performers. My agent sent us up there to to do the show. And I have all this luggage on me and it's freezing and whatever. I have to haul it up into a, a truck type thing, a, a van that they were taking us to the hotel. And I just kind of went, oh, is there a man that can help me? Because there's two reasons why I say that. A, men have more upper body strength, okay? It was going to get that luggage in there much easier than me. <laughs> like it was so heavy. And two, it makes men kind of just like feel good about themselves. Yeah. Beautiful, like a, a beautiful woman. So it's like, it, it's a win-win here. We're good. And I remember one of the other performers, she was like a jazz dance performer. For a swing, she was a swing dancer. She was like, oh. one of these swing dancer ones. Because they have different performers going to these things and we all have our roles. And she went, we don't need men. And I just remember thinking in the van, I, I didn't respond back, but I remember thinking, she all about we don't need men yes we do <laughs> yeah we do i need men like yes but, like, i understand what she's trying to say like as like this feminist like empowerment thing but like do we really need to like do that like why i need 
he can lift my luggage for me. Like, thank you, sir. Like make him feel good. I feel good. We're all, we're all like, what is the problem? Yeah. There's this push. There was this real push within social justice, the feminist part of it to sort of denigrate any, any acts of civility or um, yeah. chivalry. Yes. They were killing chivalry and then they were complaining why men suck. Like, yeah. It's like, uh, <laughs> don't have to insult someone for holding the door open for you. He's not doing right. it to let I can you do, do your place. Else, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. But it was really handy because I had all the stuff in my hands yeah. and he held the door open. I mean, am I going to make yeah. my life more difficult just because I can be like, I can do it myself. Like, yeah. Screw you for the kindness. Uh, yeah. So, so when, so you started to hear these little comments here and there, um, but but when did you really touch the tip of the iceberg? Like, when did it start to affect you? I mean, it. I think with most people, 2016, it, it, that was, things were coming to a head. And then the Trump thing, Trump was running. And for some reason that triggered people a lot, which is really confusing because Trump was kind of a, like a Democrat in New York, like, he wasn't the most conservative person you think of when you think Republican. Um, he was quite liberal, I would say. So it was weird that they took him as like, it, it was just because he ran as a Republican. I mean, they're going to do that to every Republican. And I know people, hey, Bush sucks, whatever. Yeah, neocon, mm -hmm. all that. But I remember even in the Bush days, it was like, he's a racist. And like, all of a sudden, I was like, what are you guys on about? Like, they hated him so bad. And I couldn't believe it's like, already, like, they're over hating Bush. They're like, Bush is like, fine. But I remember they hated him so bad. And now the next Republican that's in is a full on white supremacist. He's not just racist. He's a full on white supremacist Nazi. Trump. It, they don't have anywhere to go after right. that. Right. So it's like, what's going to happen when the next Republican is in office? Like, mm -hmm. it's going to be bad, because they keep upping it and upping it every single time they're only happy when they're in office and even then they still try to do their thing but yeah 2016 is kind of trump all that and i was kind of naive i knew not to talk about things backstage or with people that i wasn't fully friends with and not to start fights but uh i i wrote you know i was kind of i saw things on facebook at the time everybody was still on facebook <laughs> And I know everyone's like not on it anymore, but at the time that was like all everything was, it was my entire life. I had 5,000 friends. I had all my coworkers. I had other performers on there. I had the director of the box, like, and the producer of the box uh, that I was friends with. I had all these photographers. Everybody was on my Facebook list. And so when you see the feed, it was just so many lefty talking points over and over again and things that I was strongly disagreeing with. But what am I going to do? Am I going to go in and start an argument? <laughs> right. Like I knew that that was not going to be good for me. So I held it in and I held it in and I held it in to the point where I didn't feel like it was healthy. And it was just like, I feel like I have to express myself somehow with what's going on in politics. How am I going to do that? And then I realized I'm 30 years old. My entire identity is Lady Alchemy. There's people I worked with at the box that had no idea who Martina Marcota was. I was Lady Alchemy. We all have stage names. Mm -hmm. You know, like, do I know Trixie Little's real name? No. She's Trixie yeah. Little to me. <laughs> that's that's who she is. So no one knew Martina Marcota. And I thought, oh, you know what? Maybe if I use my real name, I can kind of get involved and have like a different side of me, a different aspect, a more serious side. So I started, bought my website, martinamarcota.com. And I started using my real name for the first time instead of being strictly Lady Alchemy. And I wrote a blog uh, about conservatism and culture and uh, even performing um, in the nude, which, you know, is pasty song what, in the nude. I think it's like all these different talking points that I had. This just stream of consciousness of how I felt about things and myself and arts and culture and my experience. Like a blog. Yeah. And I put it onto the website and... I don't know. I'm kind of an idiot with social media. And then I started my Martina Marcota Instagram, but I use the same email that I use for Facebook. So it did this thing where it connected all my 5,000 Facebook friends oh, okay. to my new Instagram. And then they saw like Trump things on it or conservative things on it. And they were like, wait, is this for real? You know, I'd get comments oh, like that. And I would get, what is going on? Are you serious about this? And I'm just like, Whoa, 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 where are you guys coming from? How'd you find this? How'd you find this? And 
people told me that it was like a notification that so-and-so your friend started an Instagram account. And I was like, no. <laughs> so once that kind of got exposed, it spread like wildfire in the community. And like, next thing you know, I'm going to work and backstage, like people that I'm saying, Oh, oh hi, hello today. They're just like, yeah. <laughs> and I was wow. like, what's going on here? Like, people were acting a bit weird with me and eventually it, it came out that like you're a racist nazi <laughs> i was like what how did that happen did they did they pile on you online or was this people saying stuff to you to your face or both or what yeah it was both online it started uh when i would comment on a girl that i worked with who's like black and i was just like calling her my friend and just a random conversation about whatever the post was about then I have another black girl that works at the same theater. I would be like, how dare, how can you call this my black sister your friend when you are a Trump supporting racist, blah, 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 blah. Wow. And I was like trying to politely interact back and explain to her that, you know, the way things are and that that's not accurate and Republicans are not all bad and, you know, what have you, or Trump supporters are not what you are claiming them to be. And she was just like, I don't want to have to hear it. I don't want to hear you anymore. Like over it, you know, like la 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 la. And I was like, okay, well, that was weird. It's going to be awkward when I come into work. And then it certainly was. Yeah. I come into work and suddenly there's a lot of, like I said, cold shoulders. I'm saying hi to because what do you do? People come in backstage. You're like, hey, how are you today? And it was just like, instead of the friendliness back, it was cold shoulders turning their back on me. And I'm like, okay. And then when I had that argument online, I kind of talked to someone that about it and they're just like, Oh, this thing with, you know, Kim and I'm like, yeah, I know. And blah, blah, blah. And then another person overhears it and she goes, what are you guys talking about? And I was like, Oh, I just had this argument and you know, I'm upset about it. And she goes, yeah, I know all about your blog. I read it. I have to say, I'm not impressed. And I'm like, okay. And then she just starts getting into arguments about politics and nitpicking how Trump is a racist because like Mexicans and the wall and, illegals and we're all illegals apparently and i'm just like i i'd rather just agree to disagree thank you yeah <laughs> and then yeah oh and then it just turned into once trump actually won uh i was not invited back to perform any longer and there was a big campaign i don't think any of us in new york expected him to win i didn't it wasn't the reason why I voted for him. I'm not just trying to vote for the winner. I vote for who I want to vote for, whether they're going to win or not. And he won, which was a surprise to me. And it was a surprise to the theater. It was a surprise to everybody. And it was so shocking. If you remember, people were so devastated. It was like the world ended. Yeah, it was a surprise to everybody in New York that he won. It was a surprise to the performers. To me, I didn't expect it. So when that happened, I unfortunately wasn't invited back to work at the theater any longer. And if you remember, it was really volatile. People were really upset. Like they were acting like they were gonna die because mm -hmm. Trump won. It was like, people were like crying about it. So when I talked to the producer too, they were like, well, yeah, you know, like this is a really upsetting time. Like New York City walking around after the election, it was like, well, I'm like, you know? yeah. <laughs> oh, like, like I would sit there, like on the toilet and just start thinking, like Trump won, like, and I'm like laughing. I'm like, oh my god, this is so fucking funny. I couldn't help but smile, but everyone was all like, like someone died. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I have to guilty admission. Mm -hmm. I was one of those people who cried the night he won. Wow. Yeah. But I I had started waking up by then. Um, but it, waking up from a cult-like ideology takes a while. Mm -hmm. And I still believed a lot of things that I hadn't, dis beliefs that I hadn't interrogated yet, that I hadn't discarded. Yes. I, I was still, I thought he was a demagogue. Um, you know, I thought it meant something awful about America. Um, right. I also wanted to understand why he won. And, but I had started waking up a little bit before that happened. Like I had started questioning if I, if I really knew what was going on in the world, 
Well, um, right, especially when the the DNC kind of really messed things up, yes. like in a sense for Bernie. They, like there was a lot of controversy that happened. I think the media itself, they were just saying how Hillary's going to win. It's like it's it's already won. And I think that that should have woken up a lot of them about the lies that they were fed. Yeah, I was a Bernie voter and that that shook me. But the yeah. real thing that shook me was watching videos during the campaign. I went down a rabbit hole on YouTube of videos of of leftists, people on my side, uh, beating up Trump supporters. I and that, that was the thing that really shook me was because I didn't know that. Ha I hadn't known that was happening until I mm -hmm. saw those. But so when he won, what you're talk describing for anybody that doesn't remember, it's like I had friends who couldn't go to work. Um, I had yep. friends who couldn't take care of their kids for a little while after, you know, people were pitching in because it was, they were so depressed and were like, I can't get off the floor crying, you know, and there people took it like a death. Google, Google had a huge forum that you can watch online where they, they brought other employees into a room and it was like a oh group God. therapy session. Yeah. After Trump they had, won. they had therapy dogs in universities. I remember that was the thing. It's crazy. Wow. It, it was really traumatic for people. And I, you have to remember it's weird it was six years ago and you kind of forget that it was that dramatic no. but like it was like it was a big deal so when that happened and then you have me who's like this trump supporter who was going on like gavin mcginnis's show you know um, like yeah. doing these things i was oh. the I was the problem to these people. I could not go to work. I mean, I didn't want to because I was scared. I don't don't like confrontation. Like that it was scary for me, but then at the same time, like I lost my passion. Like that was what mm -hmm. I love doing. I'm a performer. And what made it worse was their campaign afterwards. And their campaign afterwards was to destroy me to destroy my reputation and make sure that not only am I not working at the box, but my agent drops me that um, any gig that I get afterwards, they would contact the producers and anyone. If I was working with a photographer and I posted a photo on Instagram, they would contact that photographer. Just so you know, she's a, there was one that I would work with who uh, comes from a Muslim country. And I talked to him about everything and he didn't vote for Trump or anything, but he was like, you're a good person. And like, I know you like, we're cool. And I'm like, okay, cool. And they would contact him just so you know, she's a uh, anti-Muslim and she's a Trump supporter, blah, blah, blah. I'm like all this stuff. And he would defend me <laughs> and they would try to convince, they would go back. He sent me the messages. They would go back and forth convincing him why I'm bad. Yes. It's a, it's a social <laughs> ostracization that they're doing, but they don't, the way I've thought about it before is it's it's not like uh, voting with your feet. It's not just that they don't want to support you or they won't go to your show. They also try to to stop anyone else from working with you, from going to your show, from if it's a product, from buying the product. Like they they really want to cut you off at the cut your feet off. It's not like voting with your feet. It's like let's yeah. cut that person's feet off so they can't do right. anything. Yeah. And I've never experienced something like that. I, I never imagined that that could be like a thing. I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah. <laughs> we call it being canceled now. We call it cancel culture now. And the left like to say that it doesn't exist, but like um, I lived it. And I remember just laying in my bed in a fetal position crying like, you can't even, this isn't like I was fired from it, which is bad. You shouldn't get fired from a job over politics that that's bad you shouldn't lose any friends or family or whatever over politics but it was from every angle it was mm. friends it was everyone around me it was financially it was my gig it was my career like something mm. that i built up like i created lady alchemy i created costumes and routines and and i built up my business from working at you know like shitty bars for 50 bucks to working at one of like the coolest venues, uh, theaters in the city for fashion week and, you know, celebrities are there and, and you know, the who's who, uh, the Studio 54 of, of the day. And it was like, I built myself up to something for it to just like crumble and uh, lose everything. It, it was devastating. How long did that continue like the public defamation the pressuring people not to work with you 
writing pieces about you? It continues to this day, uh, even 2020, 2021. I, after there was a whole lot that happened in between, but to answer this question, I came back to America, came back to New York. Obviously I don't have the same career I have, but I'm willing to perform and do whatever. And I got this opportunity for 4th of July in New York, people tend to go out to the Hamptons. So there's always parties in the Hamptons and 4th of July is, is a Hampton thing. So they were doing these shows out there and I was part of the roster and we had a little zoom meeting and we're talking about, you know, okay, this is where we're going to lodge and do this and that. Next thing, you know, I get a, a message on telegram from the people organizing it. Well, it has come to our attention that things that you have said and whatever your politics, blah, 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 blah that for the safety of others, we're not going to have you. So, if I get booked today, I'm going to have so-and-so. It's a small world, a small community business in, in this yeah. like whole forming thing. There's going to be some aerialist. There's going to be some burlesque performer. There's going to be someone that knows who I am and go, oh, don't you know she's a Nazi, like <laughs> Trump supporting, racist, whatever, you know, whatever they say. Yeah. And then it's going to be like, oh, well, I'm sorry. Like, I can't book you anymore. So to this day, to this day that you, I, this makes me so angry and sad. And, but it's like, it's the same story every time. Um, there are some of the knitters I've talked to the past few years. Um, Maria Tuscan, her crime was not joining the pylon of a different right. knitter, you know, and then they yep. went after her, uh, tried to destroy her yarn business contacted everyone she worked with anytime she got banned from knitting festivals for, yep. just for doing the video saying she wasn't going to participate yep. in the, in the because, pylon. Because silence is violence. Remember? Yeah. <laughs> and if you're not going to join this pylon, then you must be part of the problem. Yeah. That, so that means you agree. So I know in Maria's case, she stopped, she told me she stopped knitting for a while. It took her joy away from the knitting because she associated it with what was happening. And I know she's since started knitting again. She's still running her business successfully, right. I might add. That's she's right. had a little bit of fun at their expense with different yarn names and stuff, woke yeah. yarn yeah. names. But <laughs> um, in your case, are you still performing? Or uh, is it something you enjoy, still enjoy doing? No, I'm not. My it, it got destroyed. I don't perform live anymore, but I found ways to keep Lady Alchemy alive. Um, I, you know, it was a full time job. That was my main career. I wasn't a waitress on the side. You know, I wasn't. I didn't have like a normal job, and then that's like what I did for fun. That was my career. I built an LLC. Uh, you know, owner of Magnum Ops Productions. Like I, I had it. That was what paid my bills. So no, I don't perform full time. I don't really make money off of it. I don't do live performances anymore, which is what it was. New York City, uh, for most people too, they don't really understand that New York City is a live performance kind of uh, city. Mm -hmm. uh, it is someone only a few feet away from you on a stage doing something. There's something really cool about that. I don't know if people have been to either a play or any sort of live performance or the circus even, it's it's a different experience to have someone live in front of you. It's it's really thrilling. And it's also really thrilling if you've been on the other end uh, on stage, because you get that theater bug and you, mm -hmm. being on stage is a, a, a certain feeling. <laughs> Having a live audience and the lights hitting you and and doing what you do, what, what you love doing, uh, there's a thrill to it. And sadly, no, I don't do that anymore, but I make videos, I do photo shoots, I'll, uh, I started a comic book, which kind of what you're saying about the knitting lady, uh, having some fun at the expense, uh, I started a comic book about my Lady Alchemy character, which I always viewed as a superhero character anyway. I mean, New York City is like Gotham City. Being a nice. burlesque performer, you're in a costume, you're running around, <laughs> like, you're like a superhero. So I kind of took what happened to me and 
it's not a political book by any means because I kind of find it tacky when you're a little too literal about politics mm. and, and art. Uh, but I kind of took what happened and turned it into a fantastical comic book story. And I sold books with that. So I made money doing that, which is great. And um, keeping it alive how I can and being creative how I can. Mm. So that's how I, that's, that's how I keep Lady Do you do the art too for the comic book? No, I hire an illustrator, mm -hmm. but I do my own photography on top of like costuming and stuff like that. So cool. costuming is pretty crafty. It's fun. Cool. It is. I love, by the way, I didn't say this at the beginning, but I got to interview your husband, Jack Buckley also. And I only saw a little bit of the room then, but I love, I love Thank the color. You. I love the decorations. I think you and I probably have similar. I love old things. Me like, too. <laughs> well, this is definitely so, our vintage room. I have a lot of antique like furniture and things. And um, yeah, he said you were gonna say that. She was like, he was like, oh, she when she interviewed me said she loved like the walls and stuff, but she's gonna see a different angle of the room today, so she probably love it. Uh, this is funny that it actually happened, but yeah, I like this is the antique room. We have different kind of vibes in different rooms. Uh, I, I like the old stuff. Well, we, my husband and I are working on a renovating an old house right now in Texas. So give us at least six months, probably. But after that, if you ever want to visit, you can see our old house. And I just oh, want to yeah. fill it with antiques. I'm excited. Yeah, um, for sure. Especially when you have an office. Like I wanted this to have that cozy, like old school mm -hmm. office feel. <laughs> well, you achieved it. I love it. Thank you. Thank so, you. so um, I, th this is a question I like to ask people. Uh, because a lot of times on deprogram, we're sort of trying to figure out what it is that pulls people into woke. Uh, and you know, a lot of that, I, I can only interpret it through my experience. And then, so I, I go out and ask other people, um, how did you fall into it? How did you come out of it for people like yourself who are sort of inoculated against it in a way you were never woke. What, what is it about you that, that you think, made you able to see through this that you weren't susceptible to because it sells itself as something very good like where yeah. it's about ending racism and sexism and oppression yeah what is it about you that helps you to see it for what it is i don't know i mean it's a good question because i mean i have siblings that aren't like me we have some of them that are like me and some of them that totally bought into the wokeness um so it's interesting because I would say the way that I was raised, but yet my siblings were raised the same way and they didn't buy into it. It might be, I think, influences who who's around you and how willing you are to be influenced by others around you. Because of course I had people in my life that were leftists, but I wasn't really susceptible to be influenced by what my friends thought. <laughs> and I always thought, and I remember when this was happening in 2016, I'm thinking, am I the wrong one? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really important question for both left and right. Like, I'm not saying buy into the cult of the right either. So there's, there's, there's issues on both sides. I get that. But whenever I get angry at the right about certain things, I feel like they're doing wrong. I go, look at the left and I go, can I subscribe to that? No, I can't. No. <laughs> and whenever I thought maybe am I wrong about a certain topic? Well, let me research. Let me find that out. I don't know. I'm not wrong about that. <laughs> so I think it's important to kind of question yourself. Don't just like subscribe to whatever is around you are doing just out of, I don't know, popularity or you know, be weak and, and just, buy into whatever your friends buy into, but also think about your own uh, points of view. Like, are you right? Research it, look it up. Don't just mm -hmm. buy into it for no reason. It sounds like you maybe had this independent streak yeah. since you were a kid, this sort of free thinker. Because sometimes when you mention your, your mother and her experience with communism, um, Sometimes people point to that, like uh, I've interviewed Constantine Kinson before who talked about his family's experience mm -hmm. with this ideology. I know people who've experienced it, maybe they haven't experienced it directly, but that like, you know, it was one generation removed. Right. And so that, but, but your siblings, you say some of them are woke. Yeah, so but I mean, I think really maybe that would, 
Yeah, I think it's a combination, but I think that also does play a role for me too. And that's why I've always explained why I have the, the views that I have, but I'm, I'm one of the older ones. So mm -hmm. it, it, years apart, you know, a few years apart makes a big difference. And then like the 12 year gap between the youngest, who's like a total commie, <laughs> makes like, that's a big difference, you know? So me, I like, I remember speaking Croatian and I remember the nineties. I remember the war, like, I'm a little bit older, so like that difference kind of does impact me where I, I'm the first American in my entire family on any side born in America. So it kind of, I feel like, yeah, maybe that influence of my mother definitely is there and like remembering where I came from. I feel like they don't really, they're American. <laughs> yeah. You say you remember the nineties is, do you think uh, sometimes I think, oh gosh, were the nineties, the, like the pinnacle of human freedom or it, 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 where do you see things going in the future as someone who's experienced this? And you said like, you're not able, you're not performing right now. Where's, what's the future of dance? And then on a, a, a bigger question, like what's, what's the future culturally, like in this country, what do you, where do you see things possibly going? Yeah, I mean, it's tough. I had a lot of hopes. And this is the thing. When this all happened to me, it was devastating and really depressing. But the one thing that I had was some hope that maybe, like, we had some exciting times ahead of us. But I don't know. I feel like, unfortunately, the right didn't really, like, do much. I feel like everyone's really settled with bitching about SJWs in Hollywood and the left, but don't actually support or create. Oh, There's some creators, but I, I don't see a lot of support for the creatives that have been blacklisted that aren't like already famous, you know, like, of course, there's the Gina Carano and, and all that stuff. Everybody loves her. And, you know, there's, there's some support, but I don't really see a, I don't know, mainstream support. I'm hoping what we can do is like the long march into in the institutions with what the left did. That's what I want. Uh, kind of like Elon Musk buying Twitter. Like, mm -hmm. okay, instead of like creating a gab or doing whatever, you know what? Just infiltrate their shit. That's what they did to us. Hollywood was Republican during the golden age of Hollywood. And then and there was McCarthyism. They, they were blacklisted, but they somehow snuck in and took it over, you know? <laughs> things institutions the universities they they were conservative back in the day but then somehow they took them over and then started changing the curriculum so i don't think it's necessarily like let's make our own hollywood or or anything like that because it's not going to happen uh i think maybe we should slowly infiltrate back and take it take it back from them that's what i would like to see what do i actually think is going to happen i don't, I don't know i think things are going to get worse Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm that's not. Okay. No, that's look. okay. I think my audience knows. I I think I think things are going to get worse too. But yeah. but I also think they're going to get better. I guess you could call me white uh, white pilled because I'm black pilled. Right, <laughs> like right. I'm kind of like I think it's going to get worse, and I think it might have to get to a, a place that's so bad that that's it, when it, things start to get better. I agree. I agree. Yeah, that, that's and, it. Like it has to be so bad, and I thought it was so bad. I thought yeah. we hit that point, but. I don't know. I feel like people are really uh, cashing in on complaining about things more than like wanting to make a difference. So mm. you support the arts, people. <laughs> you said infiltrating the current system. Do you think that's a better thing than building a, a separate system? But but what do you think about like the Daily Wire, for example? They're trying to uh, compete in the entertainment marketplace now. They're going to be... Yeah. Uh, they're paying for like Gina Carano. They're they're going to have series. They're going to have movies. Do you see any uh, future there for these alternative, like an a, a alternative ecosystem for people who aren't woke? Yeah, I mean, like I don't want to put down what Ben is doing. I actually really admire it, and you know, I, I admire Ben for being a really hard worker. Uh, he did uh, many years ago too. I remember in 2016 seeing how he wrote a book about it and did some interviews about him. What's the word to use? He, he went into Hollywood kind of like undercover agent style and exposed a lot of uh, the biases that was going on in Hollywood as far as politics go against conservatives 
And that's something they were denying for the longest time too, that there is no bias, but he, he like many years ago, he, he did it. He wrote a book on it. And so he's really been tuned in to the Hollywood thing. And so I really appreciate what he's doing and I get it. And uh, I, I wish it luck. I have no problems. I'm not saying it's, it's the wrong thing to do. Uh, I wish it well, and I hope it's successful because then that'll be a great opportunity. Um, but I personally think just like make things less about politics really and just produce like cool stuff. Yeah. I don't know how po political like the Daily Wire thing is. Maybe if it had a different name and it wasn't necessarily associated to his politics stuff because he's very big conservative and everybody yes. knows. So it's always going to be associated to politics, which kind of then, I don't know, limits it, I feel like maybe. I don't know. It's just my, my two cents. I, I wish it well. I'd, I'd love to be a part of it. I would have no problems with it, but. Yeah, I, I have a, I have a feeling I was saying this on a, a live stream earlier. Well, by the time this airs, not the same day, but, <laughs> uh, but I was, I, I think if they're smart, I hope that they're smart enough to know yeah. that all they need to do to counter woke, the, the, they don't need to be overtly anti woke and they don't need to be conservative or right. push ideology at all. They just need to make something good and entertaining. Yeah. That's and it. I mean, I, I think that Mel Gibson actually does a really good job of it because he does push like a little bit of an ideology, but he does it really well. Like when I was complaining about, so there was some TV show, I forget what it was called. Um, in 2016 that I watched and I was complaining about how, oh, it's about this religious family and the mom is super Catholic, but look at this, she's got a gay son and like, look at how backwards she is, you know? And it's like, it's, it's that kind of gotcha. It's, it's a show revolving around how this super conservative Catholic mom has a gay son. <gasps> Isn't that a like in your face to the Catholic mom? You know, like, mm -hmm. I feel like it's really like mean, it, like all the jokes were very like kind of mean towards the towards faith and i was like okay not that i'm like super religious and i like go to church every sunday like mm -hmm. so i'm not like being offended in that sense but i just kind of go okay like i roll like i see what you're doing but mel gibson he had a movie it was called like uh ruby ridge or something was that the one no not ruby ridge oh my god that's not the one it i was... don't know that one either so <laughs> <laughs> that was a real life event oh my god i don't know why i thought ruby ridge I think it was something about Ridge, some sort of Ridge, because it was literally a true story about some sort of war that a guy that was religious, he uh, didn't want to carry a gun, hold a gun or use a gun in this okay. war. It's a true story. And he was kind of like picked on the whole time in his like uh, platoon is what they call it. I don't know anything about the military. And That's okay. <laughs> this is me talking about sports. Keep going. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was like picked on about it because he wouldn't pick up a gun. They were like, oh, don't depend on him at war. Don't depend on him. And he was kind of like the shit one. But in war, it turned out that there was an event that happened that he came and just one by one got all of the injured soldiers and brought them to safety. And he's it, like, it, like it's going to make me like tear up. It was like really well done. It's a true story and how he saved like all these people, even the ones that made fun of him and everything without a gun. He came and he saved like so many people's lives by just like going in and kept, he's like, I'm going back for another one. I'm going back for another one. I'm going back for another one. And he saved all these lives. And it was a really like, that is what I feel like someone of faith is about. Like, mm -hmm. it's not about being prejudiced and um, backwards and, you know, like, no, that's not it's, what it's about. Also, people confuse religion, I think, with faith. Yeah. I, I, I've started now, I'm a pretty new Christian. I view those things differently now. Like, um, I mean, my religion, yes, it's Christianity. But that comes with so much baggage and there's so much like institutional, to use that word, yeah. um, abuse and corruption. And I know that that's the baggage people look at when you're talking about a religion. Yeah. But I don't really, that's not, that has, that doesn't, the religion doesn't say anything right. about what my faith is about, like right. about my relationship with God. It's sort of, I don't know. I, I like, understand what you're saying. You'd be like a better person. And that's what he was. It's called Hacksaw Ridge. That's what it was. I knew there was a ridge in it. That's why I got confused with Ruby Ridge. Totally different events. Both true stories. Um, <laughs> but like it, it, he just does a really good job at like portraying what like 
faith is about. And that's what I mean about like an agenda. It's like, sure, you could do it. Like he's definitely like a conservative and he definitely does films with that leaning. But you know what? I feel like a leftist could watch it. You can't deny his cinematography. You can't deny the good dialogue. And it's the same thing when I watch leftist stuff. I watch leftist things all the time because I like art. I, like, I watch like Project Runway, all sorts of stuff. And they get like, it's oh, fun. this challenge, we're going to be celebrating like Black Lives Matter or something. And I'm just kind of like, I roll, but like, okay, let's see the fashion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't care. Like, I'll watch it if it's good. So like, I don't know. It's just yeah. Like good. <laughs> they don't seem leftist or any kind of uh, puritanical ideologue. They don't have the ability, it seems, to let things roll off their back. Like they yeah. would, they would be like, "Oh, this conservative turning it off," you know? Yeah. Like, no, uh, right. who, yeah. Right. Who cares? Get past that. It's still good art, right? Yeah, you know, um, you're right because like there are things that I want to do, like documentaries, and I've talked to you privately <laughs> about some of my traumas that I've had in life, and it's like oh, I would love to do like a document documentary style thing, like have it be on Netflix. And like, I've seen stories on there like that I'm just like watching, I go, that's a fraction of what happened to me. You know, I'm just like, I wanna do documentary about that. And I was like, maybe I can do something and it can be showcased on a real platform, not just throw it up on YouTube. But then I think, oh no, the moment I explain, oh, I was canceled because they didn't like my politics or this and that, it's immediately gonna shut people off. It's immediately going to turn people off and go, oh, I don't care. Oh, that other stuff that happened to her all after that, I don't care. Good. Good thing it happened to her. Yeah. Because she's, she's a Trump supporter, so I don't really care what happened to her. Good. That, that I just want to point out for anyone listening, that is, that's cult behavior. And I, I say this as someone who was in the cult that I'm talking about. They had me, I say they, I have responsibility for, for my own actions and for shutting off my brain. But it, it worked so well on me that I had opinions about things that I had never interacted with and I knew not to interact with. So Ben Shapiro, who we mentioned, Daily Wire, I would call him a sexist and a racist and a homophobic and all these things without ever having read him or listened to a lecture. They do a, they do a very good job, like a cult, of letting you know what's outside of the cult you don't interact with. Like, we're going to tell you what to think about it, but do not watch it yourself. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking to my husband about that, too, because I'm still part of some art stuff. And I was like, you know, like, I heard them talking about something or uh, what was it? Supreme Court, this or that. And like, these are older people. Like, I like, I just don't understand, like, how do they really buy into all the like, I don't know, like trainees for kids type stuff you know like how, like i don't how do old people buy into that and he was like they don't know they don't know that stuff because yeah. that's not what's shown to them. like we see it because like it's our it's around us and we're like sharing that kind of stuff but the leftist kind of news that they watch they're not mentioning that so they have no idea that they're pushing like you know really crazy things out there it's a totally different ecosystem it's yeah. And it exists almost entirely independently of anytime they hear about something in the conservative ecosystem, it's through the lens of the way that the their media or we assume my media has has told them to think about it. And right. they've even gotten to a place now where in news articles, they'll describe what someone said. And I have to really dig to find a link the to the original quote. source. Yes. Yeah. And it's like, but I want to read the, I want to read the speech. Don't tell me what he said. I want to see the quotes and you have to dig for that now. That's crazy. I mean, I believe it because when I worked for the daily caller uh, briefly, I was in a video with a G Pai, the head of the FCC during the net neutrality thing that was going on and the media wanted to smear him. So what they did was they went, Hmm, who else is in this video? And I was literally there as a prop just dancing. Cause it was like a silly video. And I was there to just be like, boogie, boogie. Like, who's this guy? I don't know who he is, whatever. I was told to boogie. So I'm boogieing. And that was it. And then they go, Hmm, how do we smear this guy? How do we smear him? Who's that girl? And they go and they look things up and they look things up and they found a really silly, hilarious, it was like a goofy comedy video. During the time when Pizzagate was a thing, I like made this like Pizzagate video. It was a, a funny video. Like it, it was a joke. And all I did really, the only content in there that was like not a joke 
was about my experience like on the deep web like i actually went on the tor browser went to the i was curious i was like what is this deep web thing about Ooh, mysterious like yeah. <laughs> like let me get on there. Oh, the dark web yeah i like i went on the dark web and i was like snooping around and this was in like 2014 and then i came across uh the code word code, like someone said oh be careful on here you know uh be careful of like see uh cheese pizza or something and i was like what's cheese pizza and they're like oh it's code word for for child porn and so then when the pizza gate thing happened i was just like oh my god like that's a real code like i knew about this years ago like it's on the deep web it's a real code word so that was my only thing it was like oh look at that isn't that interesting other than that it was hilarious and funny there was jokes in there it was making fun of myself like but anyway point is that the media they wanted to slander me so that a g pie looks bad they went around I got Joy Reid on MSNBC, Vanity Fair, BuzzFeed, like every major outlet out there was going around saying that I'm a huge, serious promoter of the Comet Ping Pong conspiracy theory. Never mentioned wow. Comet Ping Pong. Wow. And I had people digging and digging. People blatantly bought it and I was getting death threats and there was just like, you know, it was all this whole thing. But there was a few people that went, I actually went and I looked into it and I never found anything about that. Like, and I put the video up publicly. So I'm just like, this is the video they're talking about. You're really taking this seriously? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you guys are liars. You know, I have a, I want to ask you, there are people watching this who some I know are afraid to say something. They see the problems with woke. And I hear from people all the time who are afraid to say something or afraid to hit like on a video or to share mm -hmm. or things like that. Um, they're afraid of cancellation. There are some people who might be going through or might go through their own cancellation. Yeah. What kind of advice, having having gone through this whole thing, been smeared by Joy Reid and other places, like what advice do you have for people who are afraid or people who are maybe facing some type of pile on? I mean, the people that are facing a pile on, um, you're not you're not alone and i know that doesn't sound comforting it's just like oh okay wait, i'm not alone like <laughs> it still hurts like i get it but just like know that it's it's not just you and that it's not like the end of the world uh there's a whole other i mean i've met my husband i've met a whole new set of friends i've made better friends because if those people are piling up on you and that like some of them were my friends <laughs> and they're, it sounds cliche, they're not worth it. Like they really aren't. I've met a whole new set of friends and there's people out there. And um, I think that's probably a better way to live of just cleanse. Think of like calcination and alchemy. It's like a burning and a purging of, of these people. And so they showed their face. So you're kind of lucky in that way that you got to see who's really true. Not like true to you, but like, like you really, you're that kind of person that's just gonna flip yes. like that. Okay, good, now I know. Now I yes. know I see you. I was gonna well, ask you what are the silver linings of a cancellation, but you yeah. kind of answered it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but as far as someone that like is afraid, I mean that's a little bit more taboo of opinion that I have because this is not a very like magnanimous thing to say. But um I tend to tell people sometimes that it's just like not worth like trying to pick fights, you know, like online or whatever. Like, think about, again, the long march into the institutions. We need some of you to infiltrate, okay? Not everybody has to be an activist. And I feel like that's kind of where we get confused today, especially with the internet, social media, and like 2022, it's like so hard not to be like an active, even politicians are active everyone's an activist <laughs> i'm a burlesque dancer i don't want to be an activist why am i now an activist for politics this is crazy but we need some of you to kind of work in the inside so if you can you know try to like be our little helper on the inside like that'd be great thanks like yeah. But, you know, I'm not telling you what to do if you feel you need to kind of press like on that like and someone's gonna see it oh well you know do it. I, I think I agree with you, by the way. I think okay. everybody, if they are in this fight for free speech, for individualism, like there's all different kinds of roles and not everybody has yes. to do the same thing. Yes. And also people get over or they get, 
they get past their fear on different timelines. It's not always the same timeline. Yeah. And yeah. It, but if you feel, if you don't feel compelled to speak, that's something else. But if you feel compelled to speak, the people I know who've eventually spoke, they always eventually speak. Something happens where they reach a breaking point and they have to say something. And so it'll come in its own time. Yeah, you know? I think that's a good way to put it. Yeah, like when you feel that you are ready, that's the thing. There's there's a burden to it. There's there's a, a dark side to it. So when you feel you are ready to take that front line and get like all that attacks and whatever, and you feel you're emotionally ready for I wasn't ready. I didn't know that that was going to happen. Yeah. And so for those that aren't ready for it, we still need you to do whatever. We need teachers. You know, we need we need people even inside Hollywood. I know that there's like conservatives in Hollywood. I've been told by like actual Hollywood actors, like, you know, people like just conservatives, they, they know who you are like in, in Hollywood. And that's exciting because I know that that means that there's, there's a group of them. They're all talking and they're just like, they're, they're there and we need that. Not everyone needs to go out and ruin their career for it. So like, we need you, like, it's, it's all good. But if you're ready and you're like, you know what? I want to do it. I'm ready to fight. Yeah. <laughs> do it. Yeah. What about, um, what about the importance of dance and free expression? Like, why do you, why do you love dance? Why is dance important? Why is free expression important? I mean, I think the arts in general are important, and I feel like people underestimate that. Uh, throughout history, art has had an influence on um, very powerful uh, societies and powerful people, emperors, rulers, uh, all sorts of stuff. And it, it, I think that's why the left know that and they use the arts to influence the masses and do and it's really good propaganda it works so i think there's an importance on art in general and i hope people don't forget that that's kind of my mission <laughs> aside from being lady alchemy itself when i go out and speak like my number one thing is yeah i was canceled but my my whole thing is the importance of art and culture and um that'd be really fun thing to go into depth with you about sometime. But dance in particular, uh, I don't know. It's, um, there's something, there's, there's like a trance like state. You probably understand what I'm talking about. Like dancing is kind of like a trance mm -hmm. <laughs> and it could be like a spiritual thing, yes. you know? So um, I think maybe when you're knitting, you can go into that too. There's a certain trance where you're not even like going, okay, then I loop it and, and then I'm, you're just kind of, you're like, you're doing it and mm -hmm. you get into this altered state. And like, there's something about it that is just like, what is it about like the trance state that is just really hypnotic? Like it's that, that's what, that's what dance does. You know what I'm talking about? I right? do. Have you read the, the war of art? I don't think so. Not the art of war, but the war of art. Right. Yeah. Cause I was like, I know the art of war, which is Robert Greene, I think. No. So I've only read the beginning. I, that's a book I have to, I have a lot of books I started, haven't come back to, but <laughs> he talks about, he talks about the arts, um, writing, music, dance. I guess he didn't mention knitting, but he mentioned knitting, but the <laughs> arts is like being a conduit to something divine, mm -hmm. which that's, is a, that's exactly what my point is. Yes. Yeah, it's something really when you said spiritual, I was like, yes, I get it. Like yeah. I'm I probably cheesy or conservative or square or whatever now with my new um my new faith. And but I don't care. It's like I think I do believe I believe God designed us to worship and dance and music and expression mm -hmm. for expression, all of these things are gifts that were given. And they do connect us to something bigger than us. Yeah. You know? And yeah, definitely. I mean, I guess you could, if you understand yoga, if you do yoga, you know, and there's like the poses, like there's just sometimes a certain rhythm, uh, doing something physical. They say what mind, body, and soul, right? So there's the body part. Um, and there's something really important. An athlete can understand what I'm talking about. Um, there's something about cultivating your body. I think this is why people fast. I mean, whatever religion you are, I think most of us have fasts um, or eat certain food groups together. Like they're supposed to heighten 
your senses of your spiritual aura or energy. Yeah. And that's dance does that as well. Yeah. Well, I hope you get to start performing live again. Thank you. Um, well, that's another, that. that's another aspect that's, that's like a spiritual thing because when you do it live, you have the audience that you're feeding off of, like you're mm -hmm. giving, you're taking in their attention. So you have an audience of people that are like all sitting there and their energy is all focused on you. So what are you going to do with that energy? It's all energy is re it's real. It's there. And they're all, their vibrations are all focused on you. You harness it as the performer and then like do something with it and like give it back somehow. And that's it's magic. There's a comedian I used to work with. He described it as a comedy, as like a tennis match. He's like, the audience is necessary because yeah. you're not just throwing the ball against the wall. You're throwing it back and forth. You and the audience, they're giving you something. You're giving them something. And yeah, you're like partners in a live performance. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's something different about live, but it's definitely a spiritual experience. Yeah. So, uh, Martina, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I definitely want to have you back. Maybe we could do a long conversation about art. That would be awesome. Um, but why don't you tell people where, again, where they can find you? We'll put it in the description of the video below so you guys can check it out below. But tell them where they can find you. And if they want to support you or if they want to get in touch with you, like where can they do that? Well, thank you so much. Yeah, if you are interested in the arts stuff and the lady alchemy things you can always look up lady alchemy on all of the social medias it's lady alchemy 33 on twitter but it's lady underscore alchemy on instagram and then lady dash alchemy.com for the website and if you are interested in some of my uh, commentary at times uh, i do art history oh also youtube lady alchemy uh, on YouTube with Martina Marcota, I have two different like personas. Okay? <laughs> it's to me, so there's two of everything. Uh, the YouTube, I do art history streams, and they're really fun. We, they're just a few hours long. We go through art history. Uh, the chat is always really intelligent, and we have a really good, fun time, and we get to learn something. That's what's really exciting, uh, and that's why I thank you for doing these kinds of things, because there's a lot of drama and and crap out there that people consume and gossip is a sin. And so it's nice to have more educational things that feed people and feed their soul. So art history streams, sometimes I do etiquette, which is super fun. And uh, Martina Marcota on YouTube. I think it's youtube.com slash Martina Marcota TV. And then Twitter and Instagram is Martina Marcota. M-A-R-K-O-T-A. Well, thank you, Lady Alchemy, for being here, and Martina Marcota <laughs> for being here. And you guys, check her out below. You can find all the links in the description. Again, thanks for hanging out with us. If this is a new channel, so hit like and subscribe if you haven't been here before. And Martina, I will talk to you later. Good night.